not the best way to know. Oh. And here we are going live right now. I am so excited to be here. I'm checking some things off to the side, but here we go live right now for Cauldron Conversations. I'm Saul Ravencraft. Very, very glad to have you here. We're going to have people coming into the conversation here. Uh, if you uh, are with us live, go ahead and say something in the chat so that I can see you. And of course, if you have questions at all during the show, uh, go ahead and just put them in to the chat and we will address them as we can. Uh, we won't be able to know what your questions are unless you tell us what your questions are. We're doing things just a little bit differently today. Normally you would have Madam Z here in the window with me, but today she is actually doing readings at Nature's Treasures. So it is going to be me, but I am not by myself. Uh, we have been focusing on things that are connected with the Paranormal Weekend coming up in uh, so later in September, starting the 24th is the first day. That's going to be here before we know it. And one of our key people on making this happen is Jennifer Welch. She is the one that owns the two amazing historical and haunted properties that we are going to be staying in. She is the one who is going to be leading us on the incredible uh, Bartlett Secrets Tour. And she has just been such a joy to work with. Very, very excited about this event as well. And I am happy to welcome, welcome her to the program. Uh, hello, Jennifer. Welcome, welcome. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Very glad to have you here on Cauldron Conversations. Um, so you are the owner of two key properties in Bartlett that we are going to be making use of. Uh, one is the Bartlett National Bank, and the other, I, I, I just call it the Bartlett Church. Uh, is there a better name for that? It's the historic Bartlett Presbyterian Church, built in 1899, and we call it the Bartlett Guest House now, but sure. it was the Bartlett Church. Well, it, it felt pretty churchy when I was in there. So uh, I, I, I'm still comfortable with using that name. Uh, so how did you, which, which property, which of these two properties did you purchase first? Or did you inherit them? Or, or how, did, how did they come into your possession? I definitely purchased them both. Um, I found the church first. That's what drew me into Bartlett. But then um, I happened to have an opportunity to buy the bank. And so I purchased the bank and restored it first. And I started that back um, just a couple of years ago now. Uh, it took us about six months to restore the bank. And now that that's complete, it's now, I guess, bed and breakfast. And then I set my sights on the church. And it took me several months to be able to acquire that. And we started that restoration project back last October. And we just opened it in May of this year. That's fantastic. Well, they're they're both uh, they're they're both just extraordinary properties, and uh, I'm I'm fascinated with uh, with what you've done there. Um, the uh, of the two of them, so what led you into these properties? Were were you looking at it more from an entrepreneurial standpoint to start the bed and breakfast and you were looking for properties that would fit into that? Or was there some other underlying interest that drew you there? Absolutely. So I'm a real estate broker by profession, but what I really love to do is historical preservation. And so I love the entire downtown of Bartlett. I love being able to tell the story about the evolution of Bartlett and the changes that have taken place. And just to be able to actually restore and bring these buildings back to life has just been what's drawn me in and it's just my passion. So what I love to be able to do. Sure. But it, it seems like when you got hold of these properties that maybe you got a little bit more than you bargained for. Uh, did you anticipate that there might be uh, 
a spirit presence in either one of these? So you never buy a building with that necessarily as the anticipation. Um, you're always aware that it's a possibility. Um, had several projects in the past where I've had um, extra guests on the property. And um, so it's always a possibility and I don't mind at all. I'm definitely comfortable with that. And um, so although I haven't necessarily had any experiences at the church, I have at the bank. Now, had you had any encounters or interest in hauntings and uh, ghosts and, and that sort of thing prior to your personal experiences with them? I think just a general fascination and awareness um, has always been part of what I enjoy and look forward to in building restoration. Um, so I've, I've had my fair share of experiences in the past. Um, but it's not necessarily what I'm going for. I'm not, I'm not a practice for building necessarily to see if it's haunted, um, but I'm open to the fact that there could be presence. Sure. So okay. you, you casually mentioned that you had had some experiences in the past. Uh, that's not always a casual thing for people. Uh, what, what do you mean you've had experiences with ghosts in the past? So uh, one of the buildings, so as a real estate broker, we listed a, a property out in Calvert, Texas, which um, is, I, I guess, renowned for being somewhat haunted. Um, it, it, it's haunted by a little girl, and we got her on several occasions and brought her toys, and um, each time she moves them and she opens and closes doors for us, and we're very aware of her presence when we're in the building. And um, she turns lights on and off for us, and there's no power to the building at all. And um, so, very in tune with her. That building is since sold, and someone else is uh, restoring it. And sure. they tell us it's absolutely not at all haunted, and they've had no experience. So, I'm not sure I can explain why or how, but um, we had the privilege and the opportunity of meeting her. Right. Um, and I've, I've had a similar experience with the bank. Um, where I, I may have mentioned in the past that uh, I felt a calling to bring children's dress up toys to the bank. And so I bought a copy of children's outfit because that was somewhat appropriate. And each time I would fold it away, fold it and put it away, I always hear children's laughter. And um, when your uh, guests come to the bank, they'll see that there are no children in town and it's very much right in the heart of downtown. And um, the bank is um, built with 28-inch thick walls. And so even if there were children outside on the street laughing, you wouldn't hear them. And so uh, it, it took me a little while to realize that this was probably something a little bit more meaningful. And um, we have had a parent that came in. And the spirit that I was able to speak to told me that her name was Evie. And uh, Evie happens to be the name of Mr. Bartlett's eldest daughter. And um, after a great deal of research, I did find that Evie um, died early in childhood. And so the bank now was uh, something that's very important to she and her husband. Her husband also worked there. And now it's kind of evolved into a home, something that uh, is an extension of that family. And now there's children in it, which was something that she wasn't able to have. Sure, sure. Uh, so one of the things that we've talked about from time to time, Jennifer, is the idea that people have just an innate ability to uh, shield themselves. And uh, I believe that for me, because I, I got involved in, in all this stuff to prove it wasn't true, and then ended up going way down the rabbit hole. So uh, careful what you wish for. Um, right. But I think that, that I, I began very shielded in many ways. Uh, and for me, the technique, uh, the, the practice has been learning to open up. Uh, whereas I think people that are born uh, with certain uh, levels of gift, uh, uh, stronger uh, capabilities on spirit connection, uh, find themselves needing to figure out how to 
shield themselves, how to close themselves off. So I wonder if some of these circumstances with the people who were, where you were able to connect with something there and other people weren't, that in some ways, if you aren't naturally more open than other people are, uh, how do you feel about that? I think there's probably something to that. I think I'm a little bit minded. I think I'm just more of a open person and um, be more approachable, maybe um, more thoughtful in putting together the story of these places and understanding that there are past people and past presences um, that, that lead us to where we are today. Because being able to read that and put those stories together lends itself to being able to hear those stories. Well, and I do, uh, I do want to acknowledge very quickly that uh, we are having a little bit of a garble on the audio coming from you. This happens sometimes. Uh, it's, it's just not as clean as it might be, and there can be a million different reasons for that. And it might just end up clearing itself up as we talk. Uh, but since we're live, uh, we're going to keep going here. Uh, and if anyone has any difficulty understanding what Jennifer is saying, uh, please uh, let me know and, and we can clarify on anything. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that for our listeners. It's not your computer. Uh, it is just the way the network is behaving right now. So uh, that is just life in the, in the digital Zoom broadcasting universe. Uh, so so uh, don't, don't worry about that. Um, now, the, uh, the two properties, to me, feel very, very different. Um, and I have my thoughts about why that is. But I wanted to see if, one, because you spend a lot more time in them than I do, if you do see them, uh, do feel them very differently, uh, and if so, how, and maybe what some of your thoughts might be on that. Well, I do find that they're both happy places. Um, I've never felt anything negative or felt scared or been upset on either of the properties. I think that the church has a different aura about it, maybe because it's a religious center, maybe because it's um, spiritually focused already. Um, maybe that changes the way it feels. Um, whereas the bank was more business centered, and so the presence in it and the work that was done and kind of the story that it tells is a little bit different. Um, but I think that they're both, um, both filled with greatness. I think that wonderful things took place in those buildings. And I think you feel that and you sense that when you're in both of them. I felt that the, uh, and, and I think you said this, that the, uh, the, uh, church has a, a much more grounded sort of peaceful energy. And I find that that's true of a lot of church properties that haven't been messed with, right? There, There's cases where a church is sat and it's really been terribly desecrated by people and you do get a different sort of energy in there. But I find that active churches and old churches that have remained pretty stable, that there is this sort of a, a natural grounding there. And it's not that the spirits aren't there. It's not that there's no presence there. It's just that a different kind of spirit seems to linger. And places like the bank and, and other places that are more uh, neutral or, or that have a heightened energy, an excited energy, like a jail or a hotel or something like that, you have a lot of restlessness that goes on there. Hey, pay attention to me. Hey, 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 hey. Um, and I find that in these church situations, there is a peace that's there. And I attribute it to the use of the property. Anyone that is engaged in spirituality, especially when you have a group of people that are engaged in spiritual practices sincerely, I think it creates just such a, a grounded, peaceful energy in that space. And other places where you have a lot of aggression or shenanigans going on, I think you get the, the, the opposite kind of a situation. Uh, how does that ring with what you felt in those spaces? I agree with you, absolutely. Um, but I will say that the 
bank, even though it's not necessarily a spiritual center, it was run for many years by one family and then basically transferred ownership to another family. And because of that, I think it still remains grounded. And I think because it's a small town and it's important similar to the community that there was a lot of goodness in. And I think that kept it grounded. And I think that's why we feel that goodness when we're in that building. But on the same token, the, the church was always a church. It was abandoned. And so even though it wasn't operating as a church, it was still a spiritual center and observed as such even by, to say, the passerbys and such. And it was never uh, vandalized or abused in any way. So then when we restored it, we put our heart and soul into it. And so only good, positive love has been poured into that thing. And it is a gorgeous, peaceful place. I actually enjoyed being in both of the places. Although uh, you do get a little bit different vibe when you're in that bank. Um, so th there's a, a few things. I, I don't want you to spill everything because obviously you're going to give us a lot more detail when we're there in person. But what are some key things about the the bank property that are interesting to to look forward to? Well, I think we could talk a little bit about Hollywood and the potential bank robberies and some things like that that surround the bank. Maybe not necessarily inside the bank. They weren't the core of the operation, but things that did happen at the bank. Well, uh, is uh, do you have uh, sort of a, a, a favorite sort of uh, sort of story that uh, uh, one of the things that I find fascinating and I, I think is appropriate to to tell this is there's something unusual about the bank in in the way of, of cash money. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the bank was actually a center for printing money prior to. The full establishment of the Federal Reserve. And so there is money that floats around in the, in the world that stamped Bartlett Bank, um, because that bank had a federal um, uh, license for money. And so those notes are out there. I have one of them, but they're, they're very difficult to find. And so it's a very unique bank and it had a charter. That was what I was looking for. It had a very unique charter and that that's what licensed it to be able to print money. That's that's something that's a little hard for me to wrap my head around. Uh, to to think that there was a time when banks went, could literally print money. Um, I guess they figuratively do it now, uh, but uh, that just uh, that fascinates me so much. Um, now, one of the features in this bank, and if you go back and look on the Paranormal Seance Facebook page, uh, Jennifer gave us a brief tour of the properties, um, and we got, to, uh, we got to broadcast some of that to you with her showing us around and pointing out some things. But I want to talk about that floor in the bank because I just think that is fascinating. So uh, tell us about how that floor came to be. Yes, yeah, so um, years ago I was actually peeking through the window and I could see down to the original floor. It was filthy, covered in dust, um, but there's this original, um, what we today call pen tile, um, but it's a hex. And in the tile, each piece is hand laid by one by one. And in the tile, it's not laid, Bartlett National Bank, and it's got a kind of a frame around it. And I just knew then that it was original and it, it kind of spoke to me. And that's one of the things that made me want that bank building so badly. And so when we got into the restoration, um, we found that the pieces that were missing and anything that was broken, um, we couldn't readily go by replacement pieces for because the size, the the material, everything about it just isn't made anymore. Um, so 1900 tile is just not replicated anymore. So it took us just over a year to find somebody that could actually reproduce it and make enough of it for us um, to actually finish out the 
restoration to finish that tile. But it is stunning. And when you're there, you'll notice the colors are a little bit off. Um, so we decided to go with it because it's close enough and it's part of its story. Um, it's not perfect because it's part of its restoration. Well, and it, it certainly doesn't bother me that there's some mild differences between the uh, you know century old <laughs> things that are there right. and the reproduction versions of them that uh, that are just uh, so perfect in their style and their accuracy, um, but you know just mild differences in something like color and i think it's i i, I like having a, a little bit of a differentiation between here's what was original and here's how it was finished out uh i i think that's nice and especially from the standpoint of doing paranormal exploration in there it's nice to have things that are clear indicators of what reaches back in time and and what uh what is is there more for aesthetic uh but you don't just run the bed and breakfast you are a tour guide uh have you now now you you as uh, you've been a, a realtor for for some time so i guess tour guide is sort of part of that job description uh but you've taken it a lot further have you done tours before you st uh, wrote your own no i never have and um, the more I dug into all these stories and met the characters and learned this whole thing about uh, the reason why some of these buildings and businesses came to be, um, it was too good to keep to myself. And uh, I just really thought that a neat way to share some of that would be to create a walking tour. And so that's what we've done. And every time I go on a new walking tour, I, I add a new story and learn something new and it just gets better and better. Now, were you intimidated when you began the tours, or was it something that came pretty naturally to you? Well, I think I'm a generally outgoing person, so I was looking forward to the outlet to give uh, an opportunity to be able to tell my story and to be able to share them. So I don't think intimidation was part of it. I think excitement and um, this, it was a thrilling opportunity, and, and I love to be able to go. Every time that we go out, I meet new great people, and I learn something new about Bartlett. And even though people tell me I probably know more than some of the people who've lived there their whole lives, um, I still am learning new things. Certainly, certainly. Well, I uh, I uh, led tours at the Museum of the Weird in downtown Austin for many years while I. Uh, played my intuition games with people there. And what I found was was difficult on being a tour guide was pairing all the things that you know into something that is consumable. Right. <laughs> um, because I could easily um, have walked you through the museum and spent a good hour and a half talking about the different things and telling some of the stories behind artifacts and related to the lore of the artifacts. And I had to take all of that enthusiasm and punch it down into about, you know, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> and um, I actually had to sit down and, and write a concise version of things that I could learn. Um, it was all in my own voice, so it didn't come out robotically like, like you know, maybe on some of the ride tours you get at the theme park. And now here we are going by the elephants. Don't they look like they're having fun? Uh, <laughs> you know, it was it was a lot more dynamic than that. Um, but uh, I was in a good position to field questions. So how uh, how much paring down did you have to do to be able to do a, a, a successful consumable tour? Well, I think each tour is a little bit different because sometimes I feel like I missed the story that was really important. So I'll add it in the next tour and then I have to take something out. Um, so each time I do customize it to the audience, the questions that they ask and the interest that they have. So uh, I do get an hour and a half. Um, so I, I am lucky enough to be able to have that. And um, But I do have to work every time to pare it down and to make sure that I don't get people overload. Sure, 
Sure, I can understand that. Um, do people generally have questions or do they just listen? Oh, no, it's very interactive. And um, I've got my flashlight and we're showing statistics about the buildings and we're talking about people and experiences. Um, those are things that people on the tour can relate to. And so oftentimes they want to tell me stories. They want to ask questions about things. Um, things will resonate with them and they really want to dive a little bit deeper and they'll ask me more. So as we start to walk along to the next uh, next stop, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Sure. Um, now, as far as research goes, uh, I I know that, that some of our listeners have a, a background in working with haunted properties and that sort of thing, but you're not just working with the haunted stories, you're working with the history in general. So what was your methodology for getting this information to put the tour together, and how long did it take you to design the tour? Yeah, so um, actually I think it's kind of a couple of years of work in process that actually kind of manifests itself in the tour. And so um, part of it was actually me using my real estate um, background and I pulled title and uh, learned dates and people and professions and things like that. Put a lot of puzzle pieces together that way. And then I started to head down to the cemetery and I started to head to the library. I would interview and ask lots of questions and um, just kind of listen to the stories that the buildings would tell as well. And it just eventually all came together. And I remember the things that, um, that I start to hear and feel. And it just started to accumulate until it was just bubbling up. And I needed some outlet. And that's what the tool became. <laughs> Were uh, people generally pretty open about sharing things with you? Or did you find a few people that, that didn't want to talk about certain kind of things and you had to find your own ways? You know, it's interesting because Bartlett's a small town, so occasionally there are folks who don't want to share information, especially with a newbie. And um, other times people are so open for coming because uh, they could see the work that I had done for school buildings and they knew that I had a genuine heart and that uh, my questions came from a good place. And so they would share all kinds of great information and they would redirect me to the other places and people who give me information as well and um i'd love sitting with people and i'd go knock on a horse and sit on a few front porches with lemonade and um that's how i learned quite a bit like you do in a small town sure uh, so we did have a question from the audience i believe it's susie asking um though she's using the the paranormal seance brand so it's not me asking questions to myself i think that's susie chiming in there but she is asking uh she says what is the most interesting spirit you encountered at bartlett i think that's that's a difficult question that way i mean it's not not favorites or anything like that but you've encountered a number of different spirits in your time there um is there are there any one or two especially memorable connections that that s surprised you, startled you in some way, uh, maybe changed your perspective? Well, I don't know that anything necessarily startled or surprised me, um, but I think the connection that's been the deepest has been with Kiki. Um, um, she did tell me her name was Kiki. And the street that the bank is on is the corner of Evie and Bartlett. Sorry, Evie Park. Her name is Evie Bartlett. And um, that really drove me into a lot of research that really uncovered more information than I had ever learned before. And I think that may have been what her goal was. I think she realized what I was trying to do. And she kind of pushed me in a direction to actually... Um, discover more than I had previously. Not that I was necessarily against a brick wall, um, but she just opened my eyes to a whole lot more information, and, and I was able to research and verify that. And um, and she just seems to have such a cool personality, and I just feel like if I was in the 1920s, we would, um, had tea together, and I can imagine us in our long gloves and our fancy hats walking down the street together. Um, or if she were a modern day gal, I think she'd be, um, you know, a powerhouse book, kind of like I am. So, right. 
Well, and I want to tell people that, uh, I mean, she's obviously an excellent speaker, uh, but the this medium confines you quite a bit. You, you got to sit, you got to be in the box, and uh, I want to say that you're just getting a tiny portion of the energy and enthusiasm that Jennifer puts into sharing live with you the uh, the energies and the stories of these properties and the special places in Bartlett that she's going to show on the Bartlett Secrets Tour. Uh, of course, anyone can book a tour with you by going to Airbnb or any number of places, same place they would book your, uh, your bed and breakfast. But don't do that. Join us at the uh, Paranormal Week. Weekend, September 24th to 26th you're going to be staying in these properties that Jennifer described and uh, she is going to lead us on a what I would say is probably going to be an extra special tour because unlike the mix that you normally get uh, you're going to have a whole group of weirdos uh, that, <laughs> that are a, kind of people. especially open and especially interesting and I, I would I would feel a certain pride if someone in our group asked you a question that no one had ever asked you before. Um, and you yep. if uh, you have been discovering your own witchy side there, then maybe you'll get to open that up there. Because uh, I tell you, once you start down the rabbit hole, Jennifer, <laughs> you, you never know how far you're going to go. Um, and uh, I think it's wonderful. Well, we've really reached the end of our time, and I can't thank you enough for taking the time to spend with us and share a little bit of your story and give people to have the chance to meet you. Uh, you are one of three tour guides that we're going to get to experience, three different perspectives on Bartlett and its history and its mysteries. And... Uh, it's just going to be amazing. So join uh, join us there uh, on the weekend. Uh, go to ParanormalSeance.com. There are just a few tickets left, and I do not want you to miss it. I'm looking forward to you. Jennifer is looking forward to you. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for being thank with you. us. Absolutely. Um, and like I said, thanks uh, uh, to Madam Z for uh, uh, helping to connect us with Jennifer in the beginning. Uh, she was doing uh, readings at Nature's Treasures today, and so uh, we had to rearrange this a little bit, but she'll be back with me next week, and we'll continue our conversation. Later on, we're going to have another one of our tour guides, and we'll tell you about that as that comes up. Uh, thank you for joining us on Cauldron Conversations. I am Saul Ravencraft. Our guest has been Jennifer Welch, and uh, Madam Z and I are going to see you again next week at this same time and this same channel. I wish you very good fortune.